about how to remove PHP calls, which is odd for a PHP conference. Let me start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Wim Gunn. I'm from Belgium. Um, I'm the owner of a Belgian, of course, a Belgian-based uh, PHP and open source consultancy company called Cube Solutions. I've been doing PHP and open source in general since about 1997. <laughs> Um, working on stuff like, well, OpenX is one of the things I used to work on, uh, an advertising solution. Like, I guess a lot of you, I've got a couple of standard certifications. And I've been speaking a lot at open source conferences in the past uh, two years or so. That's enough about me. Who here is a developer? Okay. Most, I guess. Any system or network engineers? Few. Any managers? Some of you are all three, which is good. <coughs> okay, so we're at a PHP conference and I'll be talking about how to remove, how to use less PHP, which is, which may seem odd, but I'm, it'll get clearer all, along the way. Now, I'm going to be taking us back a little bit in time to give a comparison, because if we want to understand where we are today and where we're going, we need to look back a little bit. I'm going to go way back to the Stone Age. Um, if in the Stone Age you wanted to show uh, people, you want to talk about something that happened, something that was new, well, you did it like this. You wrote on a wall, basically. And, uh, well, this was not really, I would say, a portable way of spreading news. If someone else wanted to have the news, they had to come and pick it up, basically. And it was nothing more than a drawing that had to be recreated every time. Um, the old days of pre-PHP, well, this is what we created. We drew something on, well, on a web page, if you can call it that. This is the original Lego site from 1996. It's, well, it's functional, but let, let's keep it at that. <laughs> But we evolved, and of course, the Egyptians, they were still drawing stuff, you know, all those pictograms in hieroglyphics, they were still drawing things. But formed together, if you put them together, those drawings, they formed some kind of a language. They formed some kind of more of an understanding and meaning. Which is the same thing what we did when we created PHP. We tried to combine things, and basically it evolved from sort of HTML with a couple of phrases, a couple of commands in between. Um, and most of the stuff that we used to run the first <coughs> 10 years and still are running today is what we call old school PHP, which means if you visit the page, you generate the same content every time. You connect to a database, you retrieve database queries, and so on. And it still works today. It works fine, for most sites at least. So we went into industrial revolution. We had something called a printing press which was great if you wanted to actually do things on a larger scale and made it easy to make big copies of everything. All you had to do was put your paper and your ink in there. Um, and that made it easy. You know, you had sort of a, a plate that you could use as a, as a template, basically. And in PHP, a similar thing happened. Uh, at some point, we said, if we have 5,000 visitors to the same page, we don't want to run those same data, database queries 5,000 times. So what we're going to do is we're going to run them once, and we're going to store the output HTML in a file, for example. And then the next time a visitor hits that page, we just get that file and throw it at the user. And after 30 minutes, we run the database query again so that the file is updated. Of course, what happens is that at some point, you, you see that in your newspaper you made a small error. You want to change something, which is where this came in, came in handy. Um, but you could actually just change those little letters on your page, make small modifications. Um, and what they did basically was take a big newspaper and split it up into a lot of different sections. And that's what a lot of people started doing in PHP as well. Instead of having one big page, they started saving the header and the footer separately. They started saving the body separately and so on. They became separate files. And what happened when a visitor visited that page, it just loaded those three files, merged them together, and output to the user. Which, again, 
works perfectly fine. We evolve into the point where we have more news. And the news is being delivered today through television. We don't have to go out and buy a newspaper every day. We just turn on, on our TV and as soon as the news agency knows it, we know it. So it's being sort of delivered to us as long as we're watching TV. Um, and this works fine. It doesn't matter if you have one person watching TV or if you have a million persons watching, it works fine. On the web, that's a totally different story, of course. There's a big difference between one visitor per day or one million visitors per day. So what do we do when we go from one million to, uh, from one to one million? Well, usually we start by adding more servers. <coughs> So now our visitors can connect to two servers that are both running PHP, connecting to a database and so on. But we have a problem here. You see, we're still writing those little files at the back. Now what happens if our admin here says, oh, I want to update some news. He's going to connect to one of those two. He's going to update one file, and now they're not going to be in sync anymore. Some people are going to see the old version. Some people are going to see the new version. So file system, it doesn't really work anymore to cache stuff. Um, now before some of you think about let's use NFS or let's use rsync, I would not recommend that. Um, you might have some locking issues and latency issues and so on. So there's, luckily there's a different way of doing it. Um, and I'm going to introduce that little M there, it's called memcache. Who here knows what M memcache is? Ooh, that's good. Who here has used it? Ooh. Yeah, well, we can discuss Redis later, yeah. Well, I'm taking memcache as an example because I'm getting back to it later. Uh, for those of you who don't know memcache, it's a memory caching system, memcache. Uh, basically, it runs on servers. You can run it on your web server, on your database server, or on separate machines. Um, and it stores stuff just in memory and it's deliverable over the network. And it's extremely fast. It will usually respond in a couple of nanoseconds. Um, and it can handle thousands of requests per second. So it's very efficient. It's a bit like saving to a file, except that you're saving over the network and you have one giant <coughs> memory-based file system. Okay. So now if our, update, if our admin decides to make an update, he just puts it into the memcache, and that's it. Okay, so we were watching television being delivered to us, but as soon as we turn off our television, well, we don't receive any news anymore, but today, we have our mobile everywhere, even on a sandy beach, and stuff is being pushed to us all the time. We can't run away anymore until, unless we, we physically turn it off, basically. Um, so, that puts kind of a lot of stress on, um, on the web infrastructure because what you're getting is, for example, if you were all following me on Twitter and I post a new tweet, then in the old days what would happen is it would all end up in each and every one of your Twitter inboxes, which would put a lot of stress on the entire system. We don't do stuff like that anymore. We handle things slightly more uh, centralized or decentralized in some other cases, but um, one of the things we could do for this situation, for example, is we still get stuff from PHP every single time. Every time we hit a page, we go to PHP, we, we get that information from memcache or from a database, even when that information hasn't changed in two years. So what's been going on the last couple of years is that people have started adding machines in front of web servers uh, called reverse proxies. And basically what happens is those machines will temporarily cache the information that is received from the database, uh, from the web server, sorry. Um, now I'm going to mention Varnish as an example, but Tess will be talking about Varnish at 12 o'clock, so won't be mentioning too much. Um, but basically what's gonna happen is that your varnish cache is, cache is going to serve a lot of those hits already. And you don't have to go to the web server, process PHP, and so on. So how does that actually work? Well, let's say we have a website, X, and we use a technology on it, which is built into uh, varnish, called ESI, 
which is Edge Side Includes. It was developed by Akamai, the content distribution network. And it allows you to split your page into multiple sections and cache them each separately. So for example, here we have a, a page with a header, some navigation structure. Now those, those are not gonna change a lot. The header usually stays the same for a couple of weeks, couple of months sometimes. Navigation probably stays the same for a long time as well. Our page content will change every now and then. And our latest news, well, we want that updated. It could be some kind of ticker that updates every now and then. So what we wanna do is cache this for like one hour, cache the header for two hours, cache the other stuff a little, little, bit, little bit less. So what we're going to do if we see this page, um, if it's being outputted by the web server to Varnish, is it's gonna look a bit like this. This is very simplified. So when we go to page ID 732, we're gonna have four tags, which basically says ESI include from source header, from source nav, from the latest news, and then finally from our article. And that's going to represent those four blocks. What's going to happen is Varnish is going to see this information and say, oh, I have to fetch my information somewhere else. And it's going to make requests to each of those URLs. So the very first time you visit that page, you get in total one request to get this and then four sub requests. So you get five requests instead of one, which is a bad thing. But the second time you visit the page, you're going to get zero requests to your web server because everything is in the internal memory it's cached. Um, so the first hit to your web server you're going to get is after two minutes when the latest news has expired in the cache. So this is a very good way of course of caching stuff because you're avoiding hitting your Apache or any other web server you're running behind it. So if we, if we were to run a benchmark, just to give you some idea, but as I said, Tess will show you a lot more about Varnish. If we were to just test how many JPEG files we could get from a web server or if we put Varnish in front, you will see that if you put Varnish in front, you will get about three times as much or four times, depending on your exact setup and configuration. Now, if we do the same thing for a page that was generated, what you'll notice is that if we have Apache and PHP running a page with three database queries, we might get something like 18 hits per second. Very slow database queries, apparently. Um, but if we put Varnish in front of that and we cache those pages, we're gonna get the same result as with a static JPEG file. So that's a massive difference. So if you, you have a site and you get lots of visitors and you have content that doesn't change a lot, then this is definitely a way to improve your performance. But Varnish isn't perfect. Um, there's a couple of stuff that it can do very well. Caching pages, caching images, um, caching parts of a page using ESI. But there's also some stuff that it cannot cache, of course. Post requests, they can never be cached. Post request means do something with the information I'm providing. So those have to go to the web server. Those have to be processed by PHP. Um, it's not a file server. Don't try to put gigabytes of data on it because it just won't work. And anything that has a cookie on it, or basically any user that is logged in, authenticated in the system, cannot be cached in Varnish by default. So if we have a page that looks like this, I am logged in as Wim Garden, and I have five messages, well, that's gonna pose a problem. I'm not gonna be able to cache that. I might be able to cache this navigation tree for an hour, I might be able to cache that content for five minutes, but because of that information, my caching time is going to be zero seconds. So I'm going to hit the web server every single time. So luckily, I discovered another very nice tool, Nginx. It's, it was developed originally by a Russian uh, to serve images on a porn site. <laughs> hey, I don't care. <laughs> uh, it's a web server. It's, uh, it's also reverse proxy, like Varnish, um, and it is unbelievably fast. It runs today on 12.3% of all websites. I had to update it again because it keeps on rising. It's the second largest web server. Only Apache is larger. So it just went past uh, Internet Information Server. And 
It doesn't use any threads, so it doesn't copy its entire code base every single time. It needs a new connection like Apache does. Um, it uses EPOL KQ for those of you who know what that means. Um, and it doesn't use a lot of memory. So for example, if you connect 10,000 times to Nginx at the same time, you're using two and a half megabytes of memory. Try that on Apache. So what we've done is work in progress. Um, we've put ESI, we've, we've implemented it in Nginx. Um, the goal being that we want to go from having our menu and our news and our user-specific content, and we want even that user-specific content to be cached. So what we do is we have those standard ESI tags, ESI include news with a TTL of five minutes, cache expiry of five minutes. We have the same for a menu. And at the top, we have a similar thing, except that we have a parameter, session equals one. Actually, it's now session equals true nowadays. Um, which will define that whatever is up there at the top is specific to this user. And it's going to cache it specific to that user. How does it work? Well, let's say we request slash page for the very first time. What's going to happen is our user is going to make a connection to Nginx, request slash page, and Nginx is going to think, slash page, I don't know it. I have no idea, so let me ask PHP. PHP is going to return nothing more than just those ESI tags. And Nginx is going to save that in its internal memory. Just that reference from slash page to those ESI tags. It's also going to push it to memcache. So we have a direct connection from Nginx to memcache. We're no longer going through a web server of some kind. It's direct. And then it's going to say, OK, now I have that piece of code, which is just a couple of ESI tags. Let me get that content now. So it's going to request those three blocks to PHP. It's going to get them back, and it's going to store them again in memcache. So it's going to store slash menu, slash news, and slash top with a specific ESI session. So the session that the user is in is going to be stored like that. What happens the next time the visitor comes to that page? Well, Nginx is going to say slash page, I know that. It's in my internal memory, and it contains three ESI blocks. And I know which ones they are, so let me fetch them from memcache. We don't hit PHP anymore. There's no connection anymore to the web server. So we're actually fetching every single thing from memory. That means if you push refresh, 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 and you're on some kind of discussion board, and all that information is stored in memcache, you're not hitting your web server, you're not hitting your database server a single time. Now, some of you might think, what happens if that, that text, you have five messages? What if someone sends you a message in the meantime? Well, if a message is sent, it's probably a post request to slash send. And what will happen is we will save that message for in the database, and we will actually rebuild that top part and just push it to memcache. Now, if I push refresh, I see you have six messages. I'm not hitting the database. I'm not hitting the web server again to do another GET request. The advantage, well, there are no repeated GET requests anymore. What do you do when a user first logs in? Well, a login is a post. So the very moment that user logs in, you actually fetch all the information you think he's going to need frequently, like how many messages he has, what's his name, uh, which are his most favorite items to show in, in some kind of bar. You fetch all of that information and put it in a the cache. Then afterwards, the user can load any page he wants. That information is readily available in the cache. Um, it, it means no repeated hits for user-specific content, but also what we can also do is we can actually get rid of that TTL. So let's say, for example, I want to add news to the site. We probably have a method called add news. And that's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to push it in the database, and it's going to push it to memcache with the key slash news. 
Now the very next time someone presses F5 on the news page, they get the latest version immediately. They don't have to wait for some kind of cache expiration to occur, it's there immediately. Oops. So no TTLs and well, imagine doing that for something like eBay. You know, the bid status, they just fetch it from a cache. They already have that kind of system in place. It doesn't run on Nginx in their case. So how many memcache requests do we have in this case? Any idea? In total? Four. Theoretically, yes, but it's only one. The main advantage of memcache is, as I showed before, we took slash page from the internal memory and then we knew we had those three ESI blocks. In reality, we just do one memcache request, requesting all the page, all the keys at once, all those pages at once. Yeah, multi gets in memcache is, is very, very powerful. Um, you can have ESI blocks within ESI blocks within ESI blocks. That will cause more requests, of course, um, but it's super efficient. Now we don't implement the entire ESI specification. Uh, the ESI specification 1.0 is from 2001, so it's a bit old. Um, but we don't take everything from it. We take just the things that we need from it. And of course we extend it because session support is not in there by default. Just to give you some idea of what code looks like. I don't know if you can see this very well at the back, but. This is basically an if-else structure in ESI. Now, it may seem a little bit complicated, but actually all we're doing is we're getting a variable. I think I have this. We're getting a variable from the ESI session, and we're checking if that variable is true. So we're checking if our user is an admin, in which case we include the key admin buttons from our memcache. And if, that doesn't, if, if it isn't present, we're going to fetch it from our PHP file. In the, other, in the other case, well, we don't have an admin user and we can do just, you know, we can just put divs there, we can just put any HTML there because the ESI tags, they're just within our HTML. And in that case, we include something else. Um, different example, we can do for each. Uh, I don't like this. Um, sadly, it's due to the ESI standard. We're thinking about um, maybe breaking that standard now to make this a little bit easier to use because this is, I mean, especially if you look at these brackets at the end, it's, it's extremely messy, yeah. Uh, is there any possibility to get uh, an access to the ESI session overall in case you are not? Um, Huh, interesting. Um, actually, what, what this is, what, what this is going to do is it's going to just fetch from memcache the item with the ID thread underscore and then the thread ID which is in your get string. So if you just write to memcache, then that's basically the same result. Um, sorry? Yeah, ESI global basically refers to memcache. Currently, we have only memcache support. The goal is to have Redis and maybe other stuff, CouchDB. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then ESI session refers to the specific user session variable. So like is admin or uh, uh, his favorites or whatever. So in this case, we just do a for each and then we load that message and it's actually being passed as I forgot something here. It should be passed as a parameter, of course, but I forgot that one, sorry. Okay, so you might wonder why did we use Nginx for this? Because Varnish already had ESI support? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, Nginx has native memcache support, so we didn't need to add it anymore, which made it a lot easier. Um, and it is extremely fast in doing sub-requests. As I said, you can have ESI within ESI within ESI, and it's super efficient. It will hand them, hand, handle them in parallel. So that was, uh, that was a very nice, uh, nice thing as well about it. Um, and it can handle thousands of connections at the same time. Now, 
Varnish can do that as well. Um, but I've noticed that Nginx is slightly more efficient in the long run. Plus, it integrates with something called PHP FPM. Is anyone here using PHP FPM? Okay. Um, PHP FPM is basically something, it's standard PHP, but it uses fast CGI protocol. Now, it's not the old fast CGI, which was buggy and slow. This is a brand new rebuild. It's been in PHP since 5.3.3, I think. Um, and it makes it run a little faster. It hooks in directly with Nginx. And you get lots of additional features. You can do stuff like shrouting, so each site can have its own um, separated environment, which is very nice. And you have something um, that you might know from MySQL. In MySQL, you have a slow query log. You have the same thing here, a slow request log. So you can actually see uh, which requests, which PHP requests were taking more than five seconds and where exactly the, that request got stuck. And you can also do rolling upgrades, so you can upgrade PHP version without actually having to restart your web server. So, you're probably wondering what's the result of all this ESI stuff in Nginx. Uh, I'm going to show you a graph, and this is the average load um, on the web and database servers of one of our customers. So that was sort of the, what happened when we enabled this feature. Um, to give you some idea, I'm not going to talk about our first customer. It was nice, but it wasn't very big. We took our second customer, brought them down from 87 to 12 machines. So they had 75 machines that they could just switch off and sell, actually. Um, we're currently doing an implementation for a customer that has a little over th almost 1,400 servers. We expect them to go down to 300, which will save them roughly that much, and probably even more by selling all those machines they don't need anymore. So yeah, you can save a lot of system resources. Um, this might not seem useful for a site that has, well, 10,000 visitors a day, but if your site is a lot bigger than that, then this is definitely uh, a very useful thing. Now, you might wonder why is it so much faster? Well, we, we, used to, we started from having um, web servers linking with PHP, PHP getting the information from memcache, getting the information from a database. What we've done now is simply eliminated the entire PHP layer. For any repeated requests, any information that we already have, we're not getting it again because it's in our cache already. To give you a real example, this is probably not visible at the end. Um, we have a customer, anyone using vBulletin here? Ooh. <laughs> Who knows vBulletin, let me put it that way. Okay, so vBulletin is discussion board software. Uh, we have a customer that is running it, has about 600,000 threads, so discussions, and about 12 million messages in the system. So it's pretty big, it's a database of 18 gigabytes. Um, and what we did was we modified, this is the thread view of a discussion about a strike in the Belgium, with the Belgian railways. Um, people discuss all different things on there. They even use it as a chat channel when, when there's a big soccer match, then they start uh, typing stuff like, hey, that was a cool move, and they start refreshing pages to see if someone responded. So it's hitting the database a lot. Um, and what we did was we took this page and turned it into one big template in ESI. And because of those, uh, those if-else statement or choose uh, statements in ESI, what you see here, the bottom part is actually only available for moderators. And all we had to do there is check if that user in his ESI session had the flag is moderator. And then automatically we let that appear. So this entire thing is one big page, which is identical for everyone, except that some parts of it are processed individually, but it doesn't go to the web server anymore for the entire page. So the result of that is that if we look at the database load, for example, this, this was running on an eight core machine, um, a standard installation, then memcache didn't add a lot to that specific page. But when we add the whole ESI setup, the database load drops a lot. Same thing for the web load. 
what we did afterwards was um, we tried to see how far we could push it, how many requests per second we could get. So if uh, the standard installation is one, then we were able to push it all the way up to 16 times as many requests per second just uh, on that single box. So anyone interested in starting to use it? Few, yeah? I have good, be good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, we are going to open source it. Um, and it's pretty stable. It's running at two customers right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Ah, okay. Well, I, I wouldn't release it if it wasn't stable, you know. <laughs> um, we're doing it two more customers, so uh, it's pretty good. The bad news, though, our first core customer holds the initial copyrights to this software. Um, not to all the changes, but to the, the initial software. So we made a deal with them. As soon as we finished setting it up for those two customers now, we're going to backport it for them, and then we're allowed to open source it. So we expect to be able to provide binaries, because we're allowed to do that, somewhere by the end of the year, beginning of next year, and the source should be available somewhere January, February. Okay. So we've taken a bit of a trip from the prehistoric to... I'm actually not, in, not sure if we've actually improved on things at the end. But any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I was scared. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, huh, that's a good question. I have no idea. Any suggestions? BSD. Got a suggestion. Uh, we have a micro microphone. <laughs> um, uh, how does the ESI standard compare to SSI, the server-side includes, which have been in Nginx since forever? Uh, well, server-side includes, um, that's basically something that runs inside your browser, as far as I remember. Well, Nginx has mod include which parses them on the server. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, th there's no actual intelligence in it as far as I know. It just fetches the file without too much additional uh, checking. And there's se definitely no session support. So it might work fine for static files that are identical for everyone. But as soon as you have a logged in user, it's just going to fetch the same file over and over again. So this solution was specifically developed for uh, people who were logged into a site because that's the biggest issue with most sites. They run fine, they're perfectly cacheable as long as people are not logged in because they can just generate the same page for everyone. But if someone logs in and they want to uh, use a specific content, um, then you need, you need to go to PHP every time, which is why this was specifically developed. Yeah, but, uh uh, the session support was your extension to ESI, right? Yeah. Uh, so ESI itself doesn't have uh, support for session No, support. no. The ESI standard doesn't. There's a lot of stuff in the ESI standard. I mean, it's... it's there's, there's the initial standard, which is like a 10-page document or 20-page document, and then you have the extensions that Akamai wrote on top of it, but that never got turned into a standard, which is like, I don't know, a 60 or 70-page document. We only implemented part of that and then added the session support to it. Thanks. Who's next? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the comparison uh, on performance between Varnish Cache uh, and Engines? I would say that in, in terms of caching static data or caching um, just being a, a reverse proxy. Uh, I mean the performance benchmark you performance on the first slide uh, based on the request. Oh yes, yeah. you won't see much of a difference. Um, it, it will depend, like for example, if, um, if you're looking at purely static files, JPEGs, Nginx will probably be a little bit slower. 
because Varnish will cache everything in its own internal memory, whereas Nginx will have to go to the file system, which will also be caching stuff, but it's one layer in between. Um, but you can push Nginx to a little bit more concurrent connections, so it will depend on your setup, really. If, if you tune both setups very carefully, I think you will get a little bit more out of Nginx, but it, it will depend. Maybe Tess has different experiences, but he's also tested them. But so, uh, what's your opinion? Uh, the varnish is better for more uh, tweakable options for caching or Nginx? Well, Varnish has, has a lot of stuff that Tess will explain, which, which, is, which allows you to configure what happens on every single request, like manipulate headers and, and banning and stuff like that. And, and that's the big advantage of Varnish. Nginx doesn't have that. If you want to do that in Nginx, you have to write a, a module, basically, for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in Varnish you could actually capture the PHP session ID yeah. uh, from the cookie by doing some regular expression magic and add that one to the hash. So you yeah. have user-specific content in separate cache objects. Yeah, so the, pr the, big, the biggest problem there is, is if data changes then you have to actually physically go into every single Varnish instance and purge the cache. It's doable. It's doable, but if you have like 10 Varnishes then but there's also a vmod, a a varnish module for memcached. I should test that and see. Yeah, I know there's there's a lot of development on varnish doing, trying to do similar things. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, what about session shared between? Uh, uh, between uh, some servers, some uh, some amount of servers. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, sessions, well, because they're stored currently in, uh, in memcache, they're automatically shared amongst all the servers. So um, the only issue you might have, but that's the case with any memcache or any memory-based uh, caching system, is if one of your memcache servers fails, then you lose part of your data. Um, there are some alternatives that will do replication. You can do certain uh, parts of replication in memcache, but it's all a bit touch and go, really. But in reality, I mean, how often does a server fail? Plus, it's cached data. Your original is still in your database, so if a request fails because it's not in the cache, you just go to PHP automatic automatically and fetch the information from its original source. What else? Okay. Uh, I'll put the slides on SlideShare, but they'll also be on, on joined in. So um, please wait my talk. Uh, tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps me to, uh, to improve it for uh, a next conference. Thank you.